Hey everybody, welcome to A Regenerative Future. I'm your host, Matt Powers. This is a podcast and YouTube show where we talk about what is possible in our regenerative future today. <laughs> and today's guest guests are Jeff Ryland and Dr. Engebretson. And they are from Iowa, Des Moines, and they are working on a therapeutic food forest that everyone should have access to at their local hospital, medical center, doctor, doesn't matter. But this a concept of a therapeutic food forest is, is not so radical. I mean, forest bathing, this concept is a medical idea in Asia. And it can be something that we can adopt here. It can be something that we can be, be, be doing here. So if, if you would like to hear about why and the how, and what's gonna, you know, what people are really doing with food forestry, with permacultures in a medical context, then stick around for this podcast, listen to it all the way through, and you will be pleasantly surprised by what is possible, what's happening already with permaculture in the medical context. All right, well, let's listen up, let's check it out. Thank you for watching. I'm Matt Powers, here we go. <laughs> Well, I don't want to overplay where we are uh, because I think I think we're just starting, and I don't I don't want to hold ourselves out there as um, <clears throat> more expert than we are. But by way of background, um, <clears throat> we're what's called a federally qualified health center or a community health center. There's around I think there's now sixteen hundred. Uh, similar entities around the country, both urban and rural, somewhere in the neighborhood, I think of six or 7,000 physical locations. So for we're what's called kind of a, a medium-sized health center, we have uh, about 38,000 individuals that we see in any one year, about 150, 160,000 visits. Uh, we're designed to serve mainly um, disadvantaged populations. Um, so f to be eligible for our services, you, you have to, for, I guess I should say for our discounted services, and if you're uninsured, you have to be below 200% of poverty, uh, which you know, maybe sounds good, but 200% of po po poverty isn't very much. It's like $40,000 a year. Um, and therefore, we do serve somewhat of a different population. Um, so in our case, about 40% of our patient population is uninsured. Another 40% or slightly under that has Medicaid. So we're, we're kind of the flip of the private practice. You know, our, our privately insured patients are the lowest uh, and our uninsured Medicaid are the highest proportion of our visits. Um, we provide a pretty broad spectrum of services. We've been doing it for close to 40 years now in Des Moines. Um, and I started the organization in the beginning and, and have held various roles through the years. And what really struck me is, you know, in, in sort of these later years is that we spend a lot of time on treating illness. We prescribe lots of medications. Um, we refer people to specialists. Um, they go into the hospital. And although, I mean, ostensibly we're interested and so forth in sort of the wellness end of things, the prevention end of things, the reality is that we as an organization and, and healthcare in general in this country don't really do a very good job at that front end stuff. So, I mean, just for example, you know, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year, a year researching new drugs for diabetes. Um, diabetes is increasingly prevalent in our society, almost certainly related to diet and nutrition and other lifestyle factors. Uh, the new drugs, you know, pretty it's a marginal improvement. They're all fighting among themselves as who you know can do the best job. But we really know that diabetes is not exclusively, and I'm talking about adult 
on onset diabetes primarily is really a drug, a, a disease of lifestyle. It's diet, it's nutrition, it's exercise, it's stress. Um, and why don't we spend more money on the front end? You know, and there is actually, there is a, a program through CDC. It's called the Diabetes Prevention Program, which um, actually has shown pretty good results in terms of keeping people from becoming diabetic. And they do actually address these kinds of things. Um, but it's not widely known. It's not widely utilized. Some of it, for good reasons, it's a bit a bit of um, administrative hassle to run the program. Um, so we just, you know, we decide, I mean, we want obviously to continue what we're doing, but we want to make a bigger impact on the front ends. So the concept of a wellness center uh, has been around for a while and, and it kind of came into fruition about a year or two ago. Uh, and, and it's kind of really been evolving. We sort of formally opened the, the wellness center, the physical center's doors about six months ago. But before that, um, we started the, the therapeutic garden uh, for a variety of reasons. We had some land, not quite an acre, almost an acre. Uh, we came across Jeff and, uh, and, and the whole idea of permaculture, which I knew about. I had you know, some readings from long ago on permaculture and primarily coming out of the Land Institute and in Kansas and um, I can't recall his name right now, who's, who's there. Um, and then Jeff, you know, had lots of connections in that arena. Plus, uh, you know, obviously the other part is the, the whole thing. And it's kind of a big thing in Iowa because we pretty much plowed up the whole state. If it isn't plowed, it's got concrete on it. So the whole thing of pollinators and prairie pollinators became a, has kind of become a bit of an issue in Iowa, at least in certain sectors. So the whole idea of focusing some of what we do on wellness, trying to keep people from becoming diabetic, for example, getting people walking. So in the garden, we build in a walking path um, Jeff designed the whole thing. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'll pause at this point, Jeff, and allow you to sort of add some comments about your initial involvement and your thoughts. And well, you guys had had those vegetable gardens, the sharing gardens. Um, they had some raised beds. Um, it was in a flat spot that came off two different parking lots that just kept the area super wet. Uh, it was on a flat spot right before a retention pond and uh, there were some drainage issues. So the rain barrels, Iowa guy, Joel Geddes sent you guys to me to help with the drainage. So we came out and um, for whatever reason, uh, it was just you that day. And you asked, have you ever heard of permaculture? I was like, Oh yeah, that's, that's exactly what I want to do or what, what I do. And, uh, um, well, I guess in my niche, it's kind of ecological, edible landscaping, but, but my goal is to for permaculture everything, but it's just a hard sell in the suburban, you know, um, Iowa especially. Um, but uh, so I, we got to talking, and uh, Dr. Ingebrigtsen was a, a fan of the Land Institute and uh, talked about his vision for the wellness center, the kind of therapeutic garden. Um, I did some research into that and uh, I forget the guy's name, you probably know, just with the side by side on the hospital, like one side of the hallway had a view of like a park or something more natural and the other side looked over the air conditioner and parking lot and the other wing of the building and they had uh, shorter stays in the hospital, less medication, higher outlook. Um, so he kind of wanted to bring that into this one acre space and um, from there it went through a few different designs so the whole space is kind of like a therapeutic healing garden where it's more almost like forest bathing where just the exposure to nature is the goal or one of the main goals so with the walking path 
um, as you come up between the parking lot, you enter down a ramp and it actually goes through, um, we kind of upgraded the food gardens. Um, so we've got uh, five, three, three or four by 16 foot beds. Um, and there, we actually, to hit the budget, you know, we could have, we would like to have done cedar, you know, just because of the durability of the wood and the natural rot resistance and things like that. Um, but to hit the budget, we, um, a friend up at Cherry Glen Learning Farm, Ray Mailer, he suggested uh, you upcycling garage doors. So these are steel or aluminum garage doors are 20 inches high. So if you're in a wheelchair or have uh, mobility issues, it's a perfect height for working. So um, they look pretty rough, you know, so, um, but we trimmed them out. I put, they're supported by landscape timbers on the side, treated, but that's not actually exposed to the soil inside. Um, we trimmed it out with cedar around the top. Um, and then it actually, some of the logs and stuff from the land we cleared, some of, uh, tree have an allianthus, it's pretty invasive. Um, and then I think I maybe got some from another tree server. So you guys had some trees trimmed. So it's actually got like a pseudo hugel culture on the inside. So they're pretty, there's a, they've got a lot of things going for them. Um, you know, filled with this, uh, soil compost sand mix, uh, top, just top dressed them with, uh, compost now. But as you go through there, this is, that's for their sharing gardens. Um, you know, a lot of volunteers, it's, uh, available to the community to use. Um, there's the church next door or kitty corner, uh, through the, um, block and, uh, I think you said you were going to share with yeah, them. They, they came over a couple of weeks ago and wanted to know what was going on. And, and so they're going to use one of the beds. I actually labeled it yesterday so people would know it says church on it. So they would know who it belonged to. Yeah. So in that space, it's also got composting bins and a couple uh, semi dwarf fruit trees on the backside. Um, and then it goes, the path continues, it goes over a little bridge. So one thing. Well, I'll describe the garden and then we'll maybe talk about some of the issues that have come up. So you go over this bridge and there's a 25, 30 foot circular seating area. Um, it's kind of a, it's trap rock. It's packs down real nice, almost like asphalt, but it's a, it's a loose stone. Um, and there's some benches in there. So a gathering place for classes or just people to sit. Um, and then as you go through, on the path, we've got strawberries on one side. Um, you know, the kind of border between the property line is elderberries and aronia. You get around the corner and we've got raspberry, blackberry trellises. Uh, and then there's a overflow from one of the swales. It's all boulders. So it looks kind of natural, but not necessarily something you'd see here in Iowa. Um, and you continue around, there's a couple seating areas. And then you go down more into the woodland area. It goes a couple under a couple mature walnuts, um, mulberries in there, just the things that were already there. Um, and then you surf. The loop goes around a circle. That's a retention pond for the stormwater retention for the two parking lots. And it's a large size space. Um, so there's a loop around there. There's a couple seating areas and. On the south side of that, we've got a mini orchard, diverse orchard. It's got peaches, pears, apples, um, with all sorts of understory, viburnum, cranberry viburnum, gooseberries, sorrel, a few ever-bearing strawberries are in this place just to run and be a ground cover. Um, and a lot of native pollinator plants too. Um, we we worked with Neil Smith Wildlife Refuge. They've got a people for pollinators program that will give prairie plugs to businesses, to organizations. Um, they don't do that anymore, unfortunately. Their funding got cut. cut. Um, but that was a great resource. We had a volunteer day, so we just plugged up some areas with all these native grasses and forbs. So we're getting, we're providing benefit for the pollinators, but we're also attracting the pollinators to our gardens and to our orchards. So it's, it's a really diverse, really natural yet productive, you know, so we're, we're trying to make the space have some output, 
but also just the experience of nature too. So we're about half a block from a really busy road um, here in Des Moines, um, but there's a gully on the other side of that retention pond. Um, it's really wooded, and when those trees leaf out, you don't really feel like you're right in the middle of the city. So that's a really, really nice benefit of just of zone five, I guess. We're, we're not really touching it. Um, so what are, what are the... Uh, <clears throat> When we started out, we thought we would probably do a community garden, um, sort of a more traditional community garden. <clears throat> and a couple of things we realized, one was that there are quite a few community gardens in Des Moines. And we all, the second thing, probably more significantly, is that we have a, an ongoing relationship that we've had for several years with the local pantry system. And this pantry system is a little bit different than many in that they are very interested in healthy foods. And, and they're not so much into the commodity foods, although you know, they use them. And what we realize, and they've got a pretty sophisticated and extensive network of um, wholesalers and other people in the grocery stores where they can get, in particular, produce from. Um, so one of the things we realized is that even if we, you know, did the whole acre and then the other acre across the gully, you know, in the community garden, we probably couldn't match the output that the pantry system can provide. So currently once a week, the pantry, and they have, um, actually now they have three mobile units. Uh, so one of their mobile units uh, parks in our parking lot every Wednesday morning. And um, so we can distribute food from there. And so the concept of the, of the, the growing area became more uh, of the sort of the raised bed area became more um, food for just sort of the people could plant there, you know, themselves to learn. And, but and then also what well, we can use it. And we're, again, we're not very sophisticated at this yet, but we can use the produce produce from that. In, in some of our nutritional classes and with the groups. So, I mean, so sort of conceptually, and so, yeah, it's a bit hokey, but um, you know, you come in, you're going to have, uh, learn how to cook fresh fruits and vegetables. Well, before we do that, let's walk down to the garden. It's not very far, it's like, you know, it's not even a half a block probably. So even someone that doesn't walk much could get that far. We'll see what's going and we'll get, get that walk back. Or maybe while we're down there, Maybe we'll even take a loop around the walking path. Um, so to kind of bring together both the concepts of the nutritional part along with the exercise, which in my mind, you know, those two are so intimately tied together in terms of a healthy life. Um, and then for our, our population, the other big thing is stress. You know, people with low resources. I don't know if you're familiar with the term social determinants of health, but that's become kind of a big thing. In, in healthcare, in terms of um, if people have trouble getting food, if people have trouble um, with um, housing, uh, they're going to probably could think of healthcare last on their agenda for the day in terms of the things they need to get done. So, um, so for example, one of our recent part, we have a big housing program already. We don't actually provide housing. But if you need housing, we can get you housed. We have a whole team of people that do. That's not funded by healthcare. That's actually funded through HUD primarily. Um, but we can we can give people access to housing. And then, so on the food side, now we've got some of the uh, the pantry in terms of supplying food for those that are food insecure. And then on the stress side, we're piloting a, a little project with. If we know that a person's both food insecure and has a diagnosis of depression, we're providing them with a, a basket a week of basically fruits and vegetables as sort of a nutritional approach to uh, depression. And then, of course, the other thing we're finding is that in this group of individuals, part of their issues have to often have to do with loneliness. You know, these are even like some of the, you know, one of the couples. <laughs> You know, they're lonely, even though they're married. You know, their life together isn't the greatest. And um, so we're trying to address some of those social determinants at the same time that we address um, 
exercise, nutrition, uh, stress. Um, we're going to be adding yoga. Um, and the, the permaculture idea, you know, fits in so nicely that, you know, the because one of the big issues with the little bit of community gardening that we did, it's really labor intensive. And now, actually, I don't know whether you know this, but your uh, golden delicious is in bloom. Oh yeah, you know I didn't. I was shocked. I walked out there. Home. Huh? At home, it is. But I mean, it, you just planted it last year, right? <laughs> and it's in bloom. I, mean, I thought this is really great. So that you know, we're going to have things that don't take a lot of work. I mean, obviously, there's some work with fruit trees, but uh, and that there'll be healthy produce coming, you know, through the years uh, from all of this upfront stuff that we've done with the permaculture planting. How has the community reaction been? Um, and, and then how has the hospital worker and the, your, the co-workers reaction been to the, this idea? Well, first of all, we're not a hospital, we're a community oh, health right, centers. Right. Yeah. I mean, just the, the, the only reason I say that is because honestly, to me, hospitals are part of the problem. And yeah. with healthcare in America and, and you know, Hospitals think they're the center of the healthcare world. The reality to me, they're just an ancillary service. They're like the lab. I need you and you know, and I need something very specific. A patient needs you for something very specific. You're not the center. And, and really what I think the center of the healthcare universe should be families and, and individuals uh, and communities and, yeah. and not the healthcare system. And, and that's a big, Big heavy lift, you know, because most of the work that we've done, I mean, well, actually, I guess I should say most of Jeff did most of it, but I mean, the work that we're doing is is primarily uh, from the staff. Prim we have multiple sites in Des Moines and actually a couple other nearby communities. Uh, and most of it, honestly, is being done by the, the staff there at the health center and in the wellness center. The wellness center staff is very enthusiastic, obviously, because they sort of believe in this but I think our our staff in general is interested and you know we're still kind of feeling our way through how to get people involved we still, one thing I didn't mention is we started a program called walk with a doc which began with a cardiologist in uh, Ohio who was seeing all these you know not very healthy heart patients and thinking you know sort of like I said in the beginning there must be some better ways and so he started this program of walking with his patients uh, on, a, I don't know how, what he if it was monthly or weekly or bi-weekly, but and now he's kind of, not exactly, it's not for profit, and so I don't say franchise it, but it's not really a franchise in that kind of way. Um, and he's got sites all over the country and a few around in other countries now. So we started that program about a month ago, and the participation is still pretty small, but the two patients that we have walking with us actually live right in that neighborhood and in that community. Uh, and, and we hope, uh, and then we've got staff and then some family members of staff. Um, and then we already mentioned the church. It's a Vietnamese church. Um, we, we actually share a parking lot with them now uh, because we ran out of space in our parking lot. Uh, so our staff park there so patients can park in our parking lot. We plow the lot for them in the winter. And as I said, they're going to use one of the, um, one of the beds uh, themselves. And we, we're trying to work more and more with like the neighborhood um, associations. We've, we've met with a couple of them. And almost always we turn up some people, you know, often it isn't the whole group, but there'll be one or two people that are interested. Uh, we've got the, the city councilwoman from that community. Um, she's been involved. She came to our first walk with the doc. Um, so, I mean, again, it's our work in progress and um, kind of like the garden. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's a work in progress. It looks a little sparse. I mean, it really looks sparse and bare at the end of winter. There was just nothing but wood chips and and some leftover stuff from last year but now it's actually starting to green up and, yeah. and look like something that's when that first one was scheduled i was like hopefully yeah, right. it's gonna walk through yeah, the wood chip and right. still land yeah it wasn't that first one probably wasn't the best time to <laughs> start the program um looking looking better now we have some radishes lettuce spinach coming up in the 
the first growing bed. So, so it's looking up. Beautiful. So what kind of uh, advice would you have for someone who is um, a medical professional who may be in administrative, maybe not, but they, they, they recognize this need and they want to start that conversation with, uh, with their own community? Well, uh, you know, the last thing I talked about was walk with the doc. And I think, I mean, that's an easy way to start because it doesn't cost too much money and they'll send you all kinds of marketing materials and they have a website and, and, and sort of there, and they'll also tell you how to do it. Um, I think, you know, getting involved with the pantry, which by the way, the, the pantry, you mentioned churches, the pantry is sort of operated by a local group called the Des Moines Area Religious Council, which is kind of a, a group of the churches that do a variety of things, but probably their biggest project is, a, is a, the pantry system. And it is, they served in November, they served over 30,000 people in, in November in, through their pantry systems. So it's, it's a pretty large and growing. So, I mean, so looking for people in the community that are sort of in this arena and already doing things. If, if you're thinking about wellness, and, you know, I mean, what are the things? I mean, to me, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, the easy ones are um, nutrition, exercise, and stress. You can probably throw in substance use, um, alcohol, uh, drugs, and tobacco in terms of um, another sort of cadre of issues. That, I mean, those are tougher ones and because they – you know, they can, you know, lead you into people with really serious problems. Um, but um, so looking for people and agencies that, that have a common interest with you, and I don't think there'll be any doubt that within any healthcare organization, probably even a small one or two professional office will probably have people that are interested in this. And, if, and most of the time, <coughs> I still am a little bit surprised at the number of nurses smoke. And of course, they always say, well, it's because of you doctors. That's why we're still, that's why we're still smoking. <laughs> but in general, you know, healthcare professionals are kind of already into this. They, they've seen, you know, what happens to people when they smoke all their lives or they see what happens to people that have bad diets and so forth. So it's, it's really not too hard to get other health professionals kind of, you know, in tune with this whole approach. And, um, and as I said, in Iowa and maybe around the country, you know, there is a growing interest. You know, what's happening to the bees? You know, uh, you know, I think there is growing, and particularly in agricultural land, which is you know most most states. Um, I think there is growing interest, and and so that's probably in my mind. And there's also good literature out there now in terms of the garden side of things. Um, there's some excellent books on therapeutic landscaping. A lot of it is drawn from hospital experiences because a lot of hospitals have actually done things with this uh, for many years, actually many decades. Uh, and other countries have done a lot of things. And then, so like in the, the online Journal of the American Medical Association, just last week, their featured article was something about what's the future of nutrition as medicine? Um, so I think there's growing awareness that um, you know, continuing to pour huge dollars down the back end of correcting the upfront problems of prevention and wellness kind of leads you down into a very costly rat hole. We already, you know, we're at least twice the per capita expenditure on healthcare as our nearest competitor around the world. And our outcomes are way down the list. We're, I mean, in terms of life expectancy, uh, low birth weight, I mean, you name it, we, we fall pretty far down the list in terms of healthiness as a country. So obviously we're spending all that money and not doing a very good job of keeping people healthy. So I think, I mean, so there are lots of people that are interested, if you can, you know, I think what, what's usually lacking is sort of the proof. Okay, so can you actually show that this makes a difference? So that same JAMA article I just referred to, 
uh, it was actually an editorial, so it was just two pages, but they referred to an article in which um, they targeted meals for people with, that based on their uh, medical conditions. And so like if you're a diabetic, obviously you got a diabetic diet. Um, and so I think it was kind of a costly intervention, but what they showed, which uh, to me was astounding, and I'm, I'm gonna be interested to see what kind of questions and feedback, but they, they said that they saved $9,000 a year in healthcare costs per patient with this program. And that's after subtracting the cost of the program uh, you know, the food itself, the dietitians. I don't know how that, I haven't read the, the actual original article yet, but, um, you know, I don't know if they, how they delivered the meals, you know, I mean, all of this, all of this cost was built into the cost of healthcare for these patients. And they said they saved $9,000, which is just astounding. I mean, you multiply that times the number of people with chronic illness, you, you know, you might be up into the trillions. You're certainly into the billions of dollars of healthcare costs right now. So um, so that's kind of what, because somebody's got to figure out how you're going to pay for these things. DMARC could expand their program uh, that we're doing with uh, the depressed and food insecure patients. But, you know, we got a little tiny grant to, to pay them to purchase the, to make sure they could have access to the healthy foods. So if you're going to, you know, obviously if you're going to, expand that to, to a larger scale, you'd have to have more dollars. So somebody's got to pay for that. You know, I would think the first people that might want to pay for that would be insurance companies. If they could save $9,000 on the chronically ill per patient, I would think they would be jumping at providing them food. But they want, you know, they want you to, to prove that it works before they'll actually upfront you that kind of money to do those kinds of things. Well, I think that there's there's certainly a lot of studies coming out, um, and I think that it's that holistic understanding that um, more generalized proof instead of that pinpointed this does this, this does that. Um, but I feel like there is a progression. Do you would you say that it's kind of inevitable that the healthcare systems of the U.S. are going to adapt? Maybe? Yeah, and I and I, as I said, I mean, when that article came out in JAMA. You know, it was one of the, probably that along with Lance and the British Medical Journal or some of the, you know, the prestigious types of journals. You know, I thought, you know, that's, a, that's, that's probably going to get some people's attention. And those dollar figures are going to get some people's attention. So I'm kind of glad we're where we are in the sense that we've actually got started and, and have been thinking about some of these things and that maybe we will be at a tipping point here fairly quickly where um, there will be more interest. In, in all of these kind of interrelated things. Because, I mean, it's all tied together. And, you know, then we, we haven't really talked, well, I guess we talked indirectly about the whole issue with the, you know, climate change and, and how all this stuff, you know, ties into that in terms of, you know, the, the whole food production process and on and on. So I actually have a question about that. So I've been studying, you know, a lot of the older histories, and then I've been studying a lot of the um, evidence for how how big our forests used to be, how how vibrant nature used to be, how tall the canopies of the trees used to be, and anatomically, uh, Homo sapiens anatomically have been roughly around two hundred thousand years. So. In that time period, we were in like such a hyper oxygenated world because of the amount of plant life, the amount of cycling. What would that have done in comparison? Because I mean, we have hyperbaric chambers, right? We use for, for, for speeding up healing, for all this stuff. I, I've always kind of turned on this idea. Now we're using activated oxygen to treat things. And what would that have done system, uh, systematically, do you think? Um, to have a world that was more oxygenated because there was more plants and a greater balance? You know, I, I, I don't think I'm probably capable of, of answering that question. I mean, other than to surmise, you know, I mean, oxygen is an interesting uh, molecule because you're right. It's, it's, I mean, it's obviously critical to life. 
but also if it goes too high, <laughs> then, you, then it's corrosive. You know, and, and and even you know even in our bodies, that same kind of thing happens. So, um, but so there's some sort of a, a healthy range, and then there's um, probably both ends are some unhealthy, and and probably I guess I've never. I've, my focus, I guess, or my reading has tended to be more on the CO2 side of things. Um, so I guess I, I don't really know for sure how it might be impacting life in terms of having drifted perhaps to the... And, and I guess I don't even know if that's the case. I mean, I think you're suggesting that the amount of oxygen probably is lower today than... Well, I yes. mean, the, the, the figures that, that we have that, we're going, that I'm going off of were the studies that were done on how cities do not produce their own oxygen and about how we're concreting over these areas, we're causing desertification, and in those areas, they literally aren't getting oxygen that was from their local area. Instead, they're mostly getting it from the ocean, you know what I mean? And it's sort of flying in into their area. Mm -hmm. um, but even in the cold of winter in the middle of Iowa, you all are getting plenty of oxygen from the ocean. Sure. But, but at the same time, there is... There, there's an effect. Um, there's a reason that hyperbaric chambers work. It's so fascinating because it is something, as you said, that hasn't been looked at. But I always think about the edges and the opposites. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, we don't know a lot of those effects. Uh, you know, I mean, there's so many things you can look at um, that we don't know what the cause is. Yeah. You know, I mean, something. You know, the things that you. Um, I mean, you can look at sort of the incidence of things. I mean, autism, anxiety, um, diabetes. Um, you know, sometimes we know the causes. Sometimes we don't know the causes. Macular degeneration. Um, I mean, there's lots of things that we don't really know why the incidence. I mean, sometimes we speculate. Sometimes we speculate wrong. And sometimes we do identify causes. But... Um, there's lots of things. Mm -hmm. so yeah, my, yeah. I mean, and it, it, I have the feeling that it is combinations of things that creates these unique effects. And that's what makes it so hard to actually treat is right. because the way we think for the most part, because of training for the most part, is to narrow down and find a right. reductionist thinking. But it's all, inter it's all interconnected. I mean, you can't. You can't change this system over here without changing everything. I mean, that you know, I think that's pretty established by now. I think there's enough science behind that to say yeah. that you can make a change in it. You know, you you clear the rainforest. You know, it, it does affect the rest of the world. You know, it's it's. I, mean, I think that's that's pretty established. So I'm sure you're right. There probably are interrelated things that are really hard to to tease out. You know, I'm just thinking the multiple, you know, some factors multiply, some diminish. So, I mean, there's just so many strings and we don't know what any one string can do purely on its own. I know. Or if that's all we've studied, we only know how it reacts just by itself. And we don't know how it impacts all the other environmental factors. And things I think like that's why it's so critical to be, to, to address things from this, this pre-problem stage, immersing in nature, having the right diet, having the exercise. And in permaculture, that's not emphasized as, as, as greatly as it should be because the circles are the same size. Earth care, people care, and future care. We're great at earth care, you know, with the science and we're dialed it in. But we've kind of left that connection to taking care of each other and taking care of our bodies and our minds interpersonal uh, interpersonal the whole the whole deal so this is truly an inspirational thing you are doing and you're really creating a path and like you said you're you know you're trailblazing um finding things along the way so i hope that we can continue to touch base and and learn more from you as you as you progress and just keep spreading these concepts sure thanks yeah be in touch sure i like I love this project because a lot of healthcare systems have the therapeutic or the healing garden, um, you know, but it's more the traditional, you know, we've got a, a little walking path, we've got some pavers, but we've got a lot of neat plants to look at and things to make you feel. We've got artificial water, we've got 
different things. But this is this is truly a therapeutic garden that is, you know, we it's built right on on dirt, you know, on, on the ground, on soil, you know. So, um, and and it's actually functional too, as far as the food production, you know. So we're taking the therapeutic garden, the immersion aspect, and you know, it's it's also providing the healthy food. Um, through the gardens, but also through um, the orchards. But, you know, you can just forage through there now too. Um, the sorrels and, you know, the gooseberries and, you know, all sorts of things that once they're established, you know, there's minimal care or care, not even necessarily by the consumer or the patient, you know, they can just go through there and, and kind of browse on, on things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like that, that garden is a metaphor for the lifestyle choices they, they, sh could could and should be making where they take these these habits and then they become these perennial benefits in their lives it's like that walking every day becomes this this regenerate regenerative aspect of their life that con consistently nourishes them that's good i hadn't thought about that yeah, right that's good. I, I think i don't know if it was chris stone or tim ferris or one of the other podcasts you know i, I check in on um you know like happiness and health and these are all things that, you know, you, or I guess true joy, it wasn't happiness. So happiness, yeah, you can watch a TV show. I'm happy for like three seconds. But true joy, it's, it's an ongoing effort, um, just like health. It's, you know, you can take your medicine so you're not sick, but you're not healthy until you take up the ongoing steps to just maintain health. You know, and that, that just triggered something else. There, there's another kind of movement out there in terms of how we evaluate things. Um, so we tend to measure your blood pressure, you know, your blood sugar, uh, your weight. But there's another measurement movement out there, which, which is actually, it's called a fulfillment measure. And it's, it's things like, you know, how's your physical health? How's your mental health? How's your social life? You know, how's your, basically your, it isn't described as financial, but, you know, are you secure? And, and a couple of other things. And, and then and alongside that, which I wasn't aware of, and I find many of my mental health colleagues aren't aware of, there's a, there's a thing out there called positive psychiatry. And, and, and the, the whole idea is, is that as a person, you're more than a diabetic. <laughs> you, you have, you know, or you're more than a schizophrenic. So the positive psychiatry is like, okay, yeah, so you got schizophrenia and you need to take these meds. But what are you good at? What do you want to do? What are the things in your life that are important to you? Let's focus on those instead of what's wrong with you. You know, what's right with you and what can you do? I mean, that's, uh, I think, more and more, I mean, that's what people really want. And it was even a thing in the, a, a diabetic blurb about that. You know, are we on the wrong path tracking A1Cs and, and what where they went to or these other things? Maybe we should be tracking, you know, like for, because for diabetics, Cost is a big thing. Insulin now is like ridiculously expensive. I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just, <laughs> it's, it's immoral how expensive insulin is today. And then, you know, how it disrupts your life. You know, I have to take shots. I have to take pills. I have to go to the doctor. You know, I mean, what kind of a life is that? And there must, you know, there must be other things that we can focus on uh, that have to do with, um, being healthy and, and being sort of fulfilled in your life. It's so hard, um, especially for folks who are um, in the midst of dealing with um, the repercussions. Uh, my, my wife is, is, is healing uh, a sixth time from cancer right now. <clears throat> and there are some days where it's just really, really discouraging in the idea of like, let's go and be active. Let's go and cultivate gratitude and go out in nature. Some days that's like, that's very hard. Um, but, it, but it is the path. And that's probably why it's so hard. <laughs> and so it's so critical. And that's, you know, why when my, we're so open about my wife's struggles with health is so that we hope that other people will follow permaculture, will eat healthy food, make better choices for their lifestyles earlier on in their lives. Maybe from the beginning <laughs> would be ideal. 
um, and and not kind of suffer the consequences that uh, that we have. Um, well, and, and you know, in all honesty, a lot of us in healthcare aren't. We already talked about how we're not too good at the front end, you know, but sometimes we're not too good in other parts as well in, in terms of, you know, instead of, you know, what drugs are going to be important at this point, you know, what do I want to do? Like, I want to go out and walk. I mean, that's, you know, we don't think much about that. We're going to be focused on, you know, what can we, you know, what can we do to help your clinical situation? But Sounds like you guys are more interested in what can you do to help our life, just, you know, get on. Absolutely. I, I yeah. wrote, actually wrote this book called Unstoppable Enthusiasm because in education, enthusiasm is the linchpin of engagement. And engagement is how you have deep, long-term memory and understanding. You go through the full spectrum of cognition that way. And so... I, in studying, so my wife has, um, has, has some, um, like, uh, some cancer in her jaw. Um, and I've never met anyone who's beat bone cancer. So I went on this, this deep study, scrambling study, basically. <laughs> um, and I figured out that basically uh, there's a bunch of different things that certain people have done. And it's only certain people. And um, they, some of them did radiation. And some of them did faith healings. And every single one of the different alternative or, or, or traditional treatments that they did was paired with this deep enthusiasm and faith and gratitude really just to be to be here and to be you know to have the opportunity to be healed and when i realized that was was the actual thread through all these different procedures um i realized that i i really needed to reevaluate what I was doing and then really di dive deep in our own lives and, and cultivate that enthusiasm so that we can make those better decisions, that we can cultivate those habits. Because if you don't have that, that spark, what do you want to do today? What gives you meaning? What makes you feel alive? You know, it, it all falls flat. And it's like, you want me to go over that and, and suddenly be better? It's like, really? It seems like this insurmountable mountain. But when, you know, when, 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 <laughs> when it's couched in enthusiasm, those challenges seem like, like, like gifts, like treats, like, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. How did you, could you repeat what, that little cognition thing you said there? That kind of, the way you went through that, how it's, it had to do with enthusiasm. And yeah, so, so enthusiasm which is what makes us feel alive, but that is really, it's measurable. And in the education world, it's enthusiastic teachers who are enthusiastic about teaching and the subject that leads directly to student engagement because it pairs with the student. It, it, it invokes and calls out the student's own enthusiasm. It's mirror neurons. And then, and then you have um, Bloom's taxonomy of cognition. And so going through, and this is an education thing, so going through not just identification, like that's an apple, not just comprehension, an apple's a food, but synthesis, application, um, and critical thinking, and then create, creative, um, creative application, like breeding your own apples or making your own you know, cider and stuff like that. But it's, it's going through that full circle of, of cognition that really allows us to, to have that deeper understanding and, and feel like we own it and have it go into our deeper memories. So just, so enthusiasm breeds engagement, mm -hmm. which then translates into better cognition and kind of a- Yeah, and so what you do with that engagement, what you do with the engagement is, and it powers them through the cognitive levels. So it, if people aren't that engaged, you can get them to understand that this is an apple and it's a food. They're like, great, yeah, it's a food. Okay, okay, okay. But when you're actually engaging them, they, they want to taste it, they want to understand how it's used, they want to go out and now do it, and then they want to be creative with it and then talk about it and be like, well, I think that apple's better. And then, you know what I mean? It, and we can relate it to anything, really. But but it's that, that cognition. And once they're 
create thinking creatively, thinking about novel applications of these ideas, and then thinking critically, being like, well, would that really work in that new context? That's when we're actually playing with ideas, when we actually have the, the, the schema to, to, to move those ideas around and apply them. And so for me, if we don't have that level, then it will be forgotten next week. Um, and so, so I really care deeply about that, not just because it's you know, what they'll be tested on, right, as a teacher, but it's how they will learn to live their lives by going to that deeper level of understanding so that they can be life learners and not have to just relearn and hit the bumpers on life all the time. That's good. <laughs> also, I like the other. Yeah, yes. actually, maybe maybe I should uh, pass along the book to you. Um, Dr. Uh, Jean Wallace um, was saying that she really feels like it would be beneficial for her patients. And as uh, did Sonal, Dr. Sonal Patel, who um, is doing a review of it for working with his substance abuse patients. He's a, um, an IV therapy guy. And so he actually only does um, rehab now with IV therapy and gets people off crazy drugs with just nutrition. It's amazing. But while they're doing it, they could be reading this book and getting their meaning focused so that they can then go out supercharged into life. So what, you have my email, I think. So what, could you just send me the reference? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah I'll send you the book. No, I, 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 I can buy it. <laughs> I'll get it off somewhere. It, it's available somewhere, isn't it? I'm assuming. Yeah, if I yeah it's, it's pre-order right now on my website, and then June 1st it comes out on Amazon. So it, it just, just came out. Oh, okay. Cool. So I don't want to hold you up, but thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you getting us together to talk about this. It's been interesting. <laughs>